Hey, I'm David. Today, we're unraveling the mystery behind a quantum game. The game has two players, Alice and Bob. They play as a team, but once they have decided their strategy, they are no longer allowed to communicate. To start the game, a referee sends each player a random bit. Alice sees only her bit and responds with another bit, and Bob does the same. If a specific logical relationship between the questions and the responses is satisfied, the players win the round. It can be shown that in a repeated game, the best possible strategy wins only 75% of the time. Now comes the interesting part. Instead of just sending random bits to Alice and Bob, we also give them entangled particles. From actual experiments, we know that by doing quantum measurements, the players can break the classical limit and win around 85% of the time. How is this possible? After all, just making a quantum measurement doesn't allow the players to exchange information. The secret lies in what particles truly are. That is what we will look at next. So, what is a particle? Um, well, there are many ways to answer that question. According to Einstein's general relativity, particles are objects moving through space and time. On the other hand, in quantum field theory, particles are interpreted as excitations of underlying quantum fields. Both of these views are valid within their respective domains of applicability, but there is an obvious tension between them. Quantum field equations describe probability amplitudes, whereas Einstein field equations are fully deterministic. The way we will try to resolve this conflict is to model particles as computational objects. In our model, particles are sequences of operations running on multiple threads. Space-time and quantum fields are just different projections of these computational objects. A nice feature of this approach is that the sequences of operations carry with them their entire computational histories. As we will see, this is the key to solving the mystery of our quantum game. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, we need to understand how these computational objects interact and how they give rise to probabilities. Suppose we have two sequences of operations. We can project these computational objects into space-time states. If the projected states are equivalent, we say that the threads are in the same location. If local threads are mutually consistent, space-like, they can interact and form a joined clique. So, threads can come together, but they can also split. This can happen in two different ways. A space-like split happens when a thread projects into two different states. A branch-like split happens when a clique is used by two different operations making the new threads mutually inconsistent. In quantum mechanics, a branch-like split is called a superposition. After these two splits, we now have three separate threads. Can you guess what happens if they again end up equivalent and in the same space-time location? Hmm, let's see. We know that our first thread is consistent with the other two. But the other two are mutually inconsistent so that they can't end up in the same clique. This is a situation that we call an open triplet. The thread marked as observer has two possible paths, and from our point of view it splits. But if we were to ask the observer after the fact, only one of the cliques would be in its computational history. This means that while the evolution is fully deterministic, 
For the inside observer, the outcome appears probabilistic. In other words, quantum field theory describes probability amplitudes because it is an observer relative theory. Now that we know the basic concepts, we can create our entangled particles. Spin is an inherent property of all particles. In our model, it refers to just another way we can project our computational objects. The concept of spin in particle physics is related to rotational symmetry, but the rotations are not space-like. This in mind, we start by making a local superposition of all possible branch-like rotations. Each of these threads we split spatially by using identity and not operations. One space-like particle we send to Alice, the other to Bob. To really drive this through, let's take an example. Here I'm going to use binary operations and start with a string of four zeros and four ones. If we rotate our string by zero, it doesn't change. If we rotate by one, the last bit simply moves to the beginning. If we rotate by two, two bits move to the beginning, and so on. Identity operations give you the same strings. Bitwise not operation swaps zeros and ones. Simple, isn't it? Next we will take a look at how Alice and Bob make their measurements. Let's start with our toy model of the entangled pair. Using her stern Gerlach machine, Alice is going to make a quantum measurement to her particle. Based on the classical bit she received, she adjusts her measurement apparatus. If the question bit was zero, she uses the default setting, if one, she rotates the dial two steps counterclockwise. Bob does the same procedure with different settings. Three cyclic shifts either left or right depending on his question. Alice and Bob split and forward their result to the referee. Let's make this a bit more concrete. Suppose the referee sends both Alice and Bob a classical bit one. By following their strategy, Alice rotates her dial two steps and Bob three steps counterclockwise. If the spin is close to the setting, the machine outputs zero, otherwise one. If the distance is exactly half, the result will be a superposition of zero and one. Both particles produce as many zeros as ones, which means that both players have a 50-50 chance of seeing a zero or one. Hmm, <clears throat> but wait a minute. If their results are purely random, how is that going to help them win the game? The catch here is that not all threads are space-like, so the referee can only see the correlated pairs. This makes it possible to align the two sets of responses so that the pairs are more likely to win. In this case, for example, when the questions were the same, the space-like pairs are more likely to be different. Statistically, this strategy allows Alice and Bob to break the classical 75% limit. Instead of calculating the probabilities by hand, we can use an app. Let's first run the simulation one step at a time. The referee starts the game by sending the two random bits and initiates the generation of the entangled particles. Next. Both Alice and Bob adjust their measurement devices, and the entangled particles are measured. All the threads then get sent to the referee, 
who records the responses. It is important to realize that here we are observing the process from an external point of view. In physical reality this is not possible, because we are part of the system. As we saw earlier, an observer inside the system can only experience one consistent set of outcomes. To wrap things up, let's run the full simulation of the game and calculate the statistical results. Each line represents one possible question pair and the distribution of its responses. If we add up the numbers, we can see that the players win over 83% of the time. This is much better than the classical 75% limit. This result is pretty good considering that we only used 8 bits to model the spin. Of course, this is just a toy model and there is a lot we don't yet understand. If you like, you can try out the model yourself and maybe help us develop it further. I'll include the link to our project in the description. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed unraveling the mystery of the quantum game.